Today. Today is May 4th, 2013 on our calendar here in the United States, and the 24th day of ER, 5773, on the Hebrew calendar. We are going to begin today with Tehillim, Psalms, chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. For those of you who are visiting, we have been systematically going through the first the Torah, and then um, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and now we are going through the Chetuvim, the writings, okay? Looking at what the Hebrew Scriptures have to say about the Messiah. And the reason we started this process, started this study, is because for most believers, they can... If they're going to talk to you about Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus, they're going to pull out their New Testament. Okay? And they're going to begin talking to you from the New Testament. But when you're dealing with a Jewish person, when you pull out the New Testament, you've automatically closed the door. Because they do not believe that the New Testament has any validity whatsoever. And so if you quote from the New Testament, they're going to completely blow off what you have to say. And so we, we took our cue from the story in the Gospels about the men on the road to Emmaus who encountered Yeshua after he had been resurrected. And it tells us that as they walked down the road, that says, starting with the Torah and the prophets, Yeshua explained to them everything about himself. Which tells me that the entire gospel message, the true gospel message of Yeshua the Messiah, is contained within what we call the Old Testament. Yeah. And you can actually witness of Messiah Yeshua without ever cracking the New Testament open. And so we have been giving, you know, we have a peculiar uh, bent in this congregation because it is a Messianic Jewish congregation that we need to understand how to speak with Jewish people about the Messiah. Yes. Okay? And so, we have been giving our people in the congregation the tools necessary to do such a thing. And of course, the Messiah is throughout the entire Bible from start to finish. And so, we're going to be dealing with, uh, to begin with, Tehillim Psalms chapter 2, Verses 7 through 12. 7 through 12. 2, 7 through 12. Now, I searched a lot of different translations and compared them to the original text. And quite frankly, I didn't like any of them. So I wrote my own. And I hope you'll permit me 
to read to you these verses using the word-for-word -word meaning of the Hebrew words, okay? And you'll find that much of it reads the same, but there are some differences. I will proclaim the decree of yod heh vav -Hey. He said to me, you are my son. Today I became your father. Ask of me, and I will make nations your inheritance, and the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with a scepter of iron. Like an article made by a potter, you will dash them to pieces. Therefore now, kings, be wise. Be warned, you who rule the earth. Give service to yod heh vav -Heh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Now, as you read in your particular translation, I'm sure you saw some differences. One of the first differences is many of the translations say, Kiss the son lest he be angry with you and you be destroyed in the way. But clearly the text says in your way. So what is being said here is you need to understand what the Messiah desires and you need to comply with the Messiah because if you do not, you can make him angry. Yes. Amen. Okay? If you continue in your way instead of his way. Okay? So it, the text actually makes that very clear. It's not the way, but in your way. The other thing is, many of the texts really soften what it has to say about his response if you continue in your way. They try to make it seem softer than what it actually says. It says, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. In other words, he is not, he doesn't tolerate people who continuously go their way. Okay? On the other hand, if it finishes up by saying, if you do pay attention to what he says and you do obey what he says, then you'll be blessed. If you take refuge in him, if you are close to him and you, are, you and he have a loving relationship and you're obedient to him, you're going to be blessed. Now this is no different... This is, this is talking about the Messiah now, folks. But this is no different a picture than what was portrayed about the Father in the Torah when He was giving the instructions to the people of Israel. And He said, you do things this way and you're going to be blessed. You don't do it this way, you're going to be cursed. The curses are going to come after you. You're going to be destroyed. Okay? Messiah is, according to the scripture, the personification of God. Fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, it says. Okay? And so, in this particular passage, because we're dealing with the first coming of the Messiah, really, this tells us that the Messiah's refuge 
is in, in God, in his Father. It also tells us that his, um, excuse me, I, I'm, I'm actually jumping ahead of myself to the next passage. So in this, in this particular passage, we understand that the Father is going to give him the nations. And the ends of the earth will become his possession. There's, there are other passages that tell us that God's enemies will become the footstool of the Messiah. That God will take repossess what has been given away to the enemy and turn it over to the Messiah. So this is in keeping with what the rest of the scripture has to say. And of course this reference to like an article made by a potter, you will dash them to pieces. This is speaking of that time when he does finally come and he has to deal with the enemies. With his enemies, with the enemies of his people. This is consistent with the rest of the Scripture and its description of the coming of the Messiah. Now what a lot of people don't understand is that the book of Psalms, we normally see the book of Psalms just as a compilation of songs and the expressions of the heart of a particular individual or actually it's a compilation of individuals just like the one that we read today as our psalm of praise today, it said it was written by the sons of Korach. But most of them are written by um, King David. But most people just see it as songs and poems and so on. Well, actually, the psalms are a poetic version of the Torah and the prophets. In other words, everything that you read about in the Torah and the Prophets is repeated in basically poetic and song form in the Psalms. Now this particular passage that we're dealing with right now cannot apply to David. And some people want to say that it applies to David himself. Because well, the reason we know that it doesn't apply to David is because God never gave David the authority over the nations, nor did David rule the entire earth. So this has to be a passage that is speaking about King Messiah. And in fact, the famous Rabbi Rashi said, our rabbis expound that this passage is relating to King Messiah. One of the other things that I want to point out before we move to the next one, next passage that we're going to deal with, is the fact that this particular passage calls him, or refers to him, as the Son of God. Okay. There's two passages, one in verse 7 and in verse 12, both identifying the Messiah as the Son of God. Now this is in contrast to what we dealt with several months ago. This is Son of God, capital S, as opposed to the sons of God, lowercase s. If you remember, when we were dealing with the whole issue of the Nephilim, it said it, there are several passages that say, the sons of God appeared before the throne. Well, that we cannot... Yeshua is not part of that group, okay? He is distinct and separate from that group. 
that sons of God, plural, with a small s, this is the Son of God, capital S, singular. And whenever you see Son of God, singular, it's always referring to the Messiah. Now let's go over to chapter 16. <clears throat> and we're going to read the entire chapter together. Tehillim Psalms 16. This is a mikham written by David. David. Protect me, God, for you are my refuge. I said to Adonai, you are my Lord. I have nothing good outside of you. The holy people in the land are the ones who are worthy of honor. All my pleasure is in them. Those who run after another God multiply their sorrows. To such gods I will not offer drink offerings of blood or take their names on my lips. Adonai, my assigned portion, my cup, you safeguard my share. Pleasant places were measured out for me. I am content with my heritage. I bless Adonai, my counselor, at night my inmost being instructs me. I always set Adonai before me, with him at my right hand, I can never be moved. So my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, and my body too rests in safety. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not let your faithful one see the abyss. You make me know the path of life. In your presence is unbounded joy. In your right hand, eternal delight. All right, now those notes that I was referring to earlier go with this passage. <laughs> so very clearly in this passage, he is talking about the fact that he, no matter what happens to him, he finds refuge in the Father, in God. And... What's interesting is that it says his delight is with the believers, okay? Right. The believing remnant. And we see, we see him actually acting out and speaking out this particular prophecy in Yochanan, John chapter 17. When Yeshua offers the prayer to the Father on behalf of the believers. If you want to turn over there. John 17, Yochanan chapter 17. If you'll look down at verse 9, he says things like this. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the whole world, but for those you have given to me, because they are yours. Indeed, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And in them I have been glorified. Now I am no longer in the world, they are in the world, but I am coming to you, Holy Father. Guard them by the power of your name, which you have given to me, so that they may be one, just as we are. When I was with them, I guarded them by the power of your name, 
which you have given to me. Yes, I kept watch over them, and not one of them was de destroyed except the one meant for destruction, so that the Tanakh might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. And he just, he goes on, and he's praying for the believers. Oh. And the point of this particular psalm, Psalm 16, is that even though God, the Father, allows the Messiah to die, yet the Messiah is expressing his confidence in the Father because he says that he knows that the Father will not abandon his soul to Sheol and will not allow him, his Holy One, to see decay. And so this is a prophecy of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he's not going to be allowed to remain in the ground. Okay, Sheol is not hell. For those of you who do not are not aware of that, a lot of times Sheol in the, like in the King James Version and many of the other translations, when they get to the word Sheol, they translate it as the word, English word hell. But Sheol does not mean hell. Sheol just simply means death. Okay? So what the Messiah is saying is, you will not abandon me to death. You will not let your faithful one see the abyss, is the way this one this translates it, or to undergo decay. In other words, he's not going to be gone from his body long enough that his body begins decaying. Did you know that that's the reason why he had to be resurrected within the course of three days? It's medically proven that after three days the body begins to decay. And so his spirit had to return to his body before three days was up. Glory. Now we're going to deal, the last passage we're going to deal with is the one that I was referring to in my prayer. At the beginning, Tehillim, Psalms 22. Most of this psalm has to do with the first coming, but the last part of it refers to the second coming of the Messiah. This is the most prophetic and descriptive psalm written about the Messiah. And the amazing thing is this, you know, we, we, and we've even addressed this in the course of this study, about how amazingly descriptive Yeshiahu Isaiah chapter 52, 13 through 53, 12 is about the death of the Messiah. <clears throat> this psalm was written before Yeshiahu's Isaiah's prophecy. And we see in this particular passage that God is fully capable to deliver Messiah, but is choosing not to. And in this passage, there is only the mention of his mother and no mention of a father. And as we've been studying, we have found out that that's actually very key and very crucial because in the beginning, in Genesis 3.15, God said that Yeshua, Jesus, would be the seed of a woman. 
Okay? Not the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman. And that's important because we find out later in the Brit Hadashah in the New Covenant Scriptures and the Gospels that Yeshua's father was not a man, but his father was God himself. <clears throat> in, in verses 22 through 31, and I'm saving the actual reading until the end for a very specific reason. <laughs> In verses 22 through 31, we, it, the psalm switches to the exaltation of the Messiah. And there's some curious things in here. And it's these kinds of things. We know that the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. But if they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead... How is it that the psalmist could write in verse 22? If, if you've got a complete Jewish Bible, it's verse 23. I will proclaim your name to my kinsmen right there in the assembly. I will praise you. This is after what we have read in the previous verses about the Messiah's demise. So if the Messiah is dead and remains dead, how can he praise anyone in the assembly? Okay? And so verses 22 through 31 tells us about what happens after Messiah's resurrection, culminating in the second coming and the establishment of his kingdom. But in verses 1 through 21, we have a description of what the Messiah went through. And I'm going to do something today that I have never done before. I've never heard or seen anyone else do it before. But I felt like I was supposed to do this today. I am going to give a dramatic reading of these first 21 verses. And I'm going to ask you to do some things for me. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes so you're just hearing my voice. And I want you to picture, if you can, the Messiah as I read this. And I will tell you right now that I am going to cry. <laughs> Because when we, when we picture the Messiah going through this, there's not a human being alive that can imagine the hell and the torment that he went through when he was hanging on the cross and taking the sins of all the world for all time. My God. My God. Why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from helping me? Why are you so far from hearing my anguish cries? My God, by day I call you, but you don't answer. 
I call for you at night, but I get no relief. Even so, you are holy. You are enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you rescued them. They cried to you, and they escaped. They trusted in you, and you didn't disappoint them. But I am not even a man. I'm a, a worm. I'm scorned by everyone. I'm despised by all the people. Everybody who sees me, they jeer at me. They sneer and they shake their heads. They say he committed himself to Adonai. So let Adonai rescue him. Let Adonai set him free. If Adonai takes such delight in him. But you are the one who took me from the womb. You made me trust when I was on my mother's breasts. Since my birth, I've been thrown on you. You are my God from my mother's womb. God, don't stay far from me. For trouble is near. And there's no one else who can help me. Many bulls surround me. Wild bulls of Bashan close in on me. They open their mouths wide against me like ravening, roaring lions. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax. It's melting inside of me. My mouth is as dry as a piece of pottery. My tongue sticks to my palate. You lay me down in the dust of death. Dogs are all around me, a pack of villains closes in on me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones while they just gaze at me and gloat. I even have to watch them Divide my garments among themselves. Here I am, hanging on this cross, suffering for them. And all they care about is my clothing. They throw dice for my clothing. But you, Adonai, please don't stay far away. My strength, come quickly to help me. Rescue me from the sword. Rescue my life from the power of these dogs. Save me from the lion's mouths. Now I want to continue with the reading because it's not left there. He says, you have answered me. 
from the wild bull's horns. I will proclaim your name yeah. to my kinsmen. Right there in the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear Adonai, praise him. All descendants of Yaakov, glorify him. All descendants of Yisrael stand in awe of him. For he has not despised or abhorred the poverty of the poor. He did not hide his face from him, but listened to his cry. Because of you, Father, I give praise in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the sight of those who fear him. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Adonai will praise him. Your hearts will enjoy life forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Adonai. All the clans of the nations will worship in your presence. For the kingdom belongs to Adonai, and he rules the nations. All who prosper on the earth will eat and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, including him who can't keep himself alive. A descendant will serve him. The next generation will be told of the Lord. They will come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he is the one who did it. All right. Let's pray. Yet again, we have pause. We have cause to thank you, Father, to thank you, Yeshua. Yeshua, if you had not been willing, if you had not been trusting in the Father, if you had not said yes to Him, not one of us would be here today in this place. You have redeemed us. You have set us free. And you suffered imaginable torment to do it. The worst pain that we could ever experience or imagine cannot compare we have no way of knowing what it was like to not just suffer physical pain, but to be cut off from you, to be totally separated from you, to cry out to you for comfort in the midst of pain and to receive none. Father, I know that for some of us as we have gone through life, there have been times in our lives where it seemed like the sky was brass and the prayers that we prayed bounced back to us. And yet even in those times when we felt like that, you had never abandoned us. But you abandoned Yeshua for a time. We cannot imagine what it would be like for you to abandon us. Father, as a general rule, we are a very ungrateful people. You have done so much for us, and we have taken so much for granted. 
Yeshua, again, thank you. Yeah. We will spend all eternity thanking you. Because every moment of eternity will be a reminder that the reason why we're there with you is because of what you did. We bless your name. We praise you. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.